And um, just before the, uh, the fire, I had finished a paper and I had left it in my room and I went down to the rec room and then um, around three o'clock in the afternoon, somebody came down to the rec room and they were yelling and saying, everybody out of the building, everybody out of the building, there's a fire. That particular weekend, um, under the old calendar, at John of the Cross feast day was the 24th of November. Mm -hmm. It was also uh, Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, and uh, so we were allowed to have a day off, which turned out to be Saturday. So uh, we were allowed on Friday to go somewhere and come back Saturday or Sunday. So I went up to Toronto and I went to St. Michael's College hunting for Father Gregory Baum. I don't know exactly how I remember, how I heard about the fire. You know, did someone say there's a fire here? Um, or did I hear fire engines? And then, you know, but at any rate, I did go up there and I'm very thankful for this because I, I went, I had a sense of going room to room. Whether someone asked me to do that, I don't remember. Opening doors, and sure enough, just a couple doors, I think, from the fire was uh, one of our seminarians, and he was sound asleep despite, despite all this going on. And um, I don't know that he would have gotten out. I, I actually woke him up. Uh, I was a novice on the farm in New Baltimore, Pennsylvania. And uh, yeah, after Vespers that evening, Father Tom Pinkle, who was the prior of the novitiate, uh, he asked for the community to sit down in the stalls in the community chapel, and he had something to tell us. And so he told us that this, just before Vespers, they had received a phone call from Niagara and that there had been a major fire at Mount Carmel. Um, and uh, Chris Howe, who was a New Yorker, uh, his parents were here and they had their, their car was just out front. And so they, I lost everything. I, all I had on was a sweatshirt and a pair of jeans. And um, they, it was getting cold, it was in November. So they invited me to come into their car. And they did have, a, they had a blanket in the car, so I put the blanket on. And then Chris's father had a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> so he offered me some whiskey. So we just thought we were sipping and we were watching the fire and then what, what, what we were watching was incredible because the fire department arrived, they connected the, the, pi the, the um, hoses and everything and when they went to put the fire was on the fourth floor and when they went to put the fire out the water wasn't going above the second floor, there was no pressure, no pressure at all mm -hmm. and we just watched that in amazement and it was incredible, they just could not get the fire, the, the, the water above the second floor and I came back late on Saturday. I was on the train, and uh, I got off the train, and I walked from the train station up the Falls View area here, and I, I noticed it was rather dark when I got I approached the building, and there seemed to be no activity. And we were supposed to have a play that night. Harry Pinkle mm -hmm. was uh, doing a, a play with others, um, and uh, I came up to him from the railroad tracks and uh, kept walking and then thinking, why is it so dark? And then I felt a rope hit me in the leg. And why is a rope hitting me in the leg, I'm saying to myself. Then I noticed a lot of water and my eyes started adjusting to the fact that it was very dark. And then I looked around and I noticed a building was missing. But then at some point, and I don't quite remember exactly when, we were all asked to go over to uh, Loretto and we went over to Loretto and we had a meeting and then the sisters of Loretto were incredible and the, and the students because they started people started bringing some food and they started bringing clothes and the sisters had all these clothes and they, they were putting them according to size and everything else so went over to Loretto or you know you uh, as I looked I it was obvious that my room was totally burned and I had lost you know everything so I can remember some people coming up to me and saying, you know, don't be afraid. And I said foolishly, oh, I'm okay. <laughs> there's, no, <laughs> there's no problem. And, you know, and, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out, now, what is this all about? There's no one here to explain anything to me. So I started looking around and I, I noticed that the lights in Loretto were on. So I went over there, just gravitated to where the lights were. 
And I came upon this scene of <laughs> our students were over there, some with blankets on them. Uh, people were bringing foodstuffs and, and the like. And I start hearing about the story. From all um, well, the, the Sisters from Loretto got over here very fast. And um, they started organizing to take all of the furniture and everything out of this wing here and out of the chapel. And um, so we formed a line and we were all lined up and we were outside and all these things were passing things down and books and desks and the altar and all kinds of stuff was coming out. It was um, as things progressed, um, there became a panic in the chapel. So I know we, I was asked to and we organized um, a crew of the guys to go down there and remove the Blessed Sacrament as there was a real fear that the chapel was going to be lost. And we took, took the Blessed Sacrament out. And Carry the whole tabernacle out, didn't they? Um, I don't know. I remember carrying vessels out. Okay. A lot of that whole wing over there was burned. So they had decided they would work on the, on the chapel, chapel the and they set the snorkel up, and that's what saved the chapel. I mean, the roof collapsed. It's incredible. The roof of the, the, of the chapel collapsed. However, none of the windows in the chapel were broken. None of them. And everything else it just collapsed to the bottom. And then people came in and were willing to take us home because we had no way to stay. So um, then they assigned us with people and we had the opportunity to go through the clothes and pick out whatever, mm -hmm. whatever we needed. And I, I didn't have anything, so I needed everything, but just, you know, took what we needed. And then the families took us home and we spent a couple days with the families. A, a people volunteered to take us to their homes. And it so happened that one of the names he mentioned, Chris Howe, and I were teamed up to go to a home out in Dorchester, way out in Dorchester Road. And uh, those kind people uh, had us for about a week. And uh, they left during the week days uh, and let us have the house. And that's where I got my love for classical music, listening to their classical music albums and reading Albert Schweitzer's uh, Reverence for Life. She asked my mother to get me for Christmas. Mm -hmm. She did. Uh, before Vespers, they had taken Brother Bernie, Brother Bernie Holloway, who was British, who was a carpenter, who was about this tall. Brother Bernie had been at Niagara for like 50 years and uh, as a carpenter. And so they took him into the priest's rec room beforehand to break the news to him. And uh, so they did, and uh, they weren't sure what the reaction would be. And, uh, but he kind of took it in stride and uh, shared with them that, you know, all of his many years here at Niagara weren't all the happiest years of his life. Because my big concern was I had early morning mass. It was going to be the first Sunday of Advent. Mm -hmm. And it was the Sunday where Luke's gospel talks about kind of everything falling in and the, the, the end of the world and chaos and commotion. And you don't know when the moment's going to happen. So I remember preaching on that because I had I had no notes or anything at that time, and so the people over there were just as interested in hearing about the fire and the tragedies, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I kind of easily preached on that gospel. The immediate effect on us was that in the weeks ahead, we had fire drills in the novitiate at New Baltimore. Uh, the novitiate was three stories tall, uh, the monastery adjoining the church along the turnpike. And uh, yeah, so we had fire drills at different times, all the alarms would go off. And one image that stuck in my mind is Brother Bernie, uh, who was there then with us, uh, leading Brother Anthony Javalak, who was blind from birth, down the hallway, out the back laundry door in the fire drill. You know, and... now, I know that in the, though there's a myth in the province a little bit that you know, I lost, I did lose everything but there's a myth that I, I lost my theses, my doctoral theses. In those days, we did not have a computer, so everything was typed and on paper. The truth of the matter is that I was, had, was organizing cards. I had a couple of file uh, boxes of cards that I had organized to begin organizing a thesis. And I had ideas, and I had all these things on cards. So. I didn't actually lose a typed thesis or anything, mm -hmm. 
I lost all the books. I used, to, mm -hmm. I used to give up uh, lunches at Columbia University to be able to buy some books that you know were necessary for research um, on a topic on American Catholic history. So, the weeks that followed until Christmas, until we were sent home, and then returning after Christmas, trying to resume our schedule for the second semester. Um, and uh, when we came to a close in May, um, decisions were made about shifting the novitiate from New Baltimore, Pennsylvania, where it had been for well over 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, you were that last class that didn't finish there. You came up here for profession. And when you finished your profession ceremony up here, we, the new novices, had to clean up the place for a year. Mm -hmm. So we were the free labor uh, for that year. I heard there was like five inches of water on the chapel floor. Oh, there could have been. I, I just remember shoveling the chapel floor, which in that floor is still the original floor. Yeah. But I remember we were in there because all of the ceiling had caved down on it. So we were in there with shovels and we were just mm -hmm. shoveling it all out. Mm -hmm. And of course, a big impact is that I was in my fourth year, so I graduated from here, but everybody behind me, then we moved on that summer, we, we, we moved on to Marquette, and we moved the whole college operation, and we just went to Marquette. Uh, so, so no longer would we be in the isolated, insular experience of this uh, seminary college, uh, but instead we were going to find ourselves within months, uh, within months thrust onto the stage of a major Catholic university. That was a major change for us to have this formation program now from a campus of 100 students to 10,000 students to co-eds uh, to all the uh, wonderful possibilities of a university in a major city, Milwaukee. And uh, that filled us with both kind of anticipation and fear also. How are we going to do competing with all these students? Uh, well, there was nothing to worry about that because, believe me, the academic regime and experience here at Niagara was so rigorous that by the time we got to Marquette, Marquette was a snap compared to Niagara. But uh, my experience of what it did for the province is it opened us up to a world that we did not choose that kind of fell to us. Uh, Marquette accepted us en masse, all the students, they accepted all the students. And we wound up having the best grade point on the campus because we had the best study habits. Yeah, the first semester, 39 frots, the cumulative grade point average was B+. Plus. Yeah. I couldn't believe yeah. that. And we just had good study habits from yes. here, yes. which we transferred to there. I think, you know, it, it actually after that, there wasn't, I didn't have a doctorate, and there really wasn't a spot for me to teach at Marquette in history. But... Um, doors do open, as they say. The Lord opens other doors. I found that the first semester was rather hard on my math. I had a very bad math score. And Mr. Mikalski, yeah. did you have Mr. Mikalski? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I failed yeah. Mr. Mikalski myself. Right. Yeah. My, highest, my highest test was 20 out of 100. That was the highest one. That was when I was guessing the answers. But uh, yeah, I was doing all in the other courses, and I asked uh, Father Phil Kenny, who was our, our priest in charge of our wing, if I could get out of that course. He said, you're doing well in the other courses. You'll catch up. I said, I don't think so. And, um, and I was correct, I didn't. So then I, I did go up to Marquette and visit it a number of times. And you could just tell that it opened up new vistas and new challenges mm -hmm. for uh, seminarians going through. And for us, because you know we always had prayers and laws and vespers and all in Latin, and among many of us, most of the books were lost and there were no replacements for them. So we got English very recent, it turned to English, we started praying in English. The and Lord's then, Vespers and Compline book? Same thing, yeah. yeah. Just and then we just had Lords and Lords and Vespers mm -hmm. and Compline. And then the other thing was that um, the habits, because we wore habits in those days, and many of us had lost habits, so we didn't have habits anymore. And uh, in fact, at, at one point, I think we were, we were accused by some of throwing our Latin breweries and habits into the fire. But it, it opened up a whole thing. Plus and it really was an earthquake experience because the shape of formation of the province was never the same as it had been before. 
But also, I think the, the impact on the town. Mm -hmm. You know, the town really wanted us to stay here, mm -hmm. and they took up this this huge collection, helped save Mount Carmel. Mm -hmm. You know, besides the, the the clothes and everything else that they, they gave to us in the, in the homes that we were able to go to, but um, they really got together. I mean, every single store and every all every, all through the city, they had these these little banks to help save Mount Carmel, and people mm -hmm. were just incredibly. Generous. Uh, and also, when we fixed cleaning the place up, mm -hmm. we put, put tours on, and local people came. And relationships, I still have relationships with people from 1968-69. I don't know this to be a fact, but I would have guessed, and I thought of it at kind of around that time, that possibly it was a blessing a little bit for the city in terms of this is before all the high-rises were built here mm -hmm. in Niagara Falls. And, you know, they obviously had to improve their fire service. And this may have woke them up that they had to, to do different things and <laughs> to get water that at least reached the fourth floor sort of thing. Again, there's been a continuity in these 50 years. And the spiritual center continues to reflect uh, all that the men who built this place from the 1890s onward, even go back to 1875 when they got the property mm -hmm. from Bishop Lynch. Uh, it's a wonderful testimony to our identification with Niagara Falls mm -hmm. uh, and the, the people of Ontario in particular and the people on the frontier, uh, frontier uh, from which many vocations have come to the Carmelites. So I'm grateful that, uh, that I was uh, a party to a tragedy. Uh, my own personal reaction was that I was startled and uh, uh, I was really shaken because Niagara was my favorite place on earth, and for me, Niagara was and is home. And uh, as I had said, uh, I always wanted to go to Niagara if, if it was just to sell popcorn to the tourists. And, uh, but those, those days were very much formative of uh, ourselves as uh, men who became friars, and we had a horizontal relationship with each other that uh, was a bonding thing. That fire was a bonding thing. Los cameri, vitis florigera, splendor celi, virgo puepera, singularis. Matemitis, sed virine shia, Jesus, I see you. 